Welcome back and thanks so much for staying with Africa News Network First Fast Live. If you've just joined us, good evening. My name is Cindy Mabi. The Bank of Baroda has decided to end its South African operations. The bank has notified the Registrar of Banks of its decision to exit from the country. A statement released by the Reserve Bank says discussions are to ensure an orderly withdrawal so that no depositor is disadvantaged. The bank will now stop taking new deposits and dispersing loans from the 1st of March. It will cease to operate and conduct the business of a bank with the effect from the 31st of March this year. And there's no clarity yet on the reasons behind and the decision to withdraw its business. Now, while there is no official confirmation of the reasons behind the exit, here's what may have uh, prompted the decision. Last month, the asset forfeiture unit froze a 30 million rand held in the Bank of Baroda's account with Nedbank. The money is no longer at the disposal of the Bank of Baroda. And the bank had frozen funds are not proceeds of crime, but uh, the bank deposits of innocent third parties. And the bank has 2.4 billion rand in deposits from customers and the removal of 30 million Rand imperils banks' ability to satisfy solvency requirements. On the day after announcing its exit from South Africa, the Bank of Baroda will be in court to oppose the freezing of its assets, and the bank is seeking an urgent interdict and requesting the funds to be released, citing catastrophic impact on its business. A national prosecuting authority says the funds are from money laundered in a government-backed dairy farm project in the Free State. And the bank says uh, while it does not dispute the NDPP on the source of, that, of those funds, it is neither a part of the project nor a beneficiary. And here are the reasons cited by the bank to back its appeal for the release of uh, its money. Frozen funds are not proceeds of crime, but bank deposits of innocent third parties. And frozen assets include Optimum and Kruenkluf or Kurenfontein, rehabilitation funds for when those mines will close down. And uh, to comply with a court order in the outer case, the bank cannot permit any encumbrance uh, in respect of the rehabilitation funds. And preservation and attachment of the 30 million rand by Nedbank constitutes an encumbrance and the removal of 30 million rand imperils the bank's ability to satisfy solvency requirements. And the bank has been facing the heat over its Estina account and in its affidavit, the bank also seeks to clarify on the status of this account. And the bank says that the Estina project had an ordinary current account with the Bank of Baroda. And as of the 31st of August 2015, the bank only had 2,218 rand to the Estina's credit. Estina account with the Bank of Baroda became dormant in January 2016. And uh, on the 29th of December 2017, Estina account had only 2,300 uh, rand. And the bank says uh, that any funds, irrespective of the source, are transferred to Estina and are not available to the bank for its own use. Now, Steinhoff International has declined to comment on a former chairperson Christo Vise's decision to sell his shares from the troubled company. This comes as report emerged that Vise, who was the major shareholder in the company, reduced his shareholding from 21% to 6%. The announcement means that Vise's net worth fell from 59 billion rand to about 25 billion rand after the sale. And contacted for the, a comment, the retail group says Vise sold his shares in his personal capacity following his resignation from the group in December last year. And Vise's move has been described as a sign of lack of confidence in the company he helped to build. Steinhoff's share price fell by approximately 160 billion rand following the accounting irregularity scandal. The PIC, which lost billions of pensioners' investments in Steinhoff, is quoted as saying it would be strategic for Vise to sell to a local cons a consortium. And this would help keep control of the company in South African hands. Meanwhile, the DA questioned how Vise could cut his stake Shortly after telling the Finance Committee there was value locked up in his standoff shares. In his presentation to Parliament, Davisi says the news of the scandal came as a shock to him. Steinhoff, like most groups I imagine, is a hugely complicated group in terms of inter alia, operating in 33 countries with a multitude of companies and subsidiary companies, all of which people have often asked me, how can, you, how can management run such a company? The only way it can be run 
is in a decentralized fashion. In other words, where you have for every business or every country a separate independent board with management and with uh, all the right board structures, including audit committees. And we join on the phone line Adiel by Adiel and Chabeling, Transform RSA President Leon Lowe from the Free Market Foundation. It's Epo Khadima, political analyst in studio. Good evening to you and thanks so much for joining us. Is there even room to negotiate to ensure that uh, the bulk of the investment remains in South African hands as proposed by the PIC? Well, I'm, I'm flabbergasted that uh, the PIC would suggest that. The shares of Steinhoff are available on the market, and uh, if they do believe that there was merit in or there was value in those shares, I'm sure there would have been investors who would have bought them, and PIC itself, uh, well, what stopped them from buying those shares? So their suggestion is ludicrous, to say the least. Uh, I think let's look at you know, what is Steinhoff. I think on Saturday when the news broke that uh, Christo Wiese has sold uh, down his shares from 21% to 6.2%. That translated to over 70.47% of the number of shares that he held, which he has now sold. So we must now maybe re-look at what is Steinhoff. The issued market uh, capitalization, issued shares in Steinhoff are 4 billion 310 million shares thereabout that are tradable and the PIC we, is now the single largest shareholder in, uh, of the 4.31 billion shares. And it would mean that it translates that 21% of 4.31 billion shares would have been 905,100,000 shares thereabout. So if you sell 70.47 of those shares, it means 637 million shares were sold by Christo Wiese and therefore pocketing at the current uh, trading price. We don't know what he sold the shares for, whether he sold them you know, through a, uh, a, a, a arrangement or if it was on the open market, but it would mean that he has pocketed 3.5 billion rent. The question that therefore must be asked, how was it possible that the regulators, the securities market regulators, and in this case, the JSE, allowed the immediate past chairman of Steinhoff, who had or was supposed to have had intimate knowledge about the financials of Steinhoff Group, how was he allowed then to offload this number of shares, pocket three and a half billion rand, when so many other shareholders, by the way, have lost real money because the other shareholders paid for the shares, he would have acquired those shares by virtue of him being the founder of the group that in turn took mm. that number of shares in, in, in start. Just, just hold the Why was that it allowed? It puzzles me. Let, let's suppose that question, uh, Mr. Leon Lowe from the Free Market Foundation, in the sense that obviously not all um, animals are created equally. And in this case, uh, Mr. Christo Vici, uh, being even richer, despite the scandal and the investigations that are currently underway uh, with uh, in Steinhoff International. Yes, I presume that the regulator will see whether there is anything that was done unlawfully, and if so, of course, they should prosecute it. Uh, it would be surprising, I think, if Christo Visa didn't make sure that he'd had all the regulatory formalities complied with. We don't know to whom he sold, and we don't know if there was any uh, you know, question of should he have been allowed to, quote-unquote. Uh, maybe he didn't need to be allowed to. So uh, the regulator has to look into that. That's the Reserve Bank, the Treasury, the PIC, uh, the Financial Services Board, the various government agencies responsible, and they would have to check to see whether he did anything unlawful. But I think the point was absolutely correct that the PIC could indeed have bought those shares or might itself be thinking of selling its shares. Uh, it should never have been this in, in this in the first place. The heads of its uh, analysts, investment analysts, should roll. They didn't do due diligence on Steinhoff, and they have been responsible for these massive losses. Yeah. I'm fascinated that in the public debate, investment analysts have been let off the hook. They are the guilty parties here. All right, so let's get a response from Mr. Khadima. Also that there's preferential treatment, as you're saying, in the nature of how these shares were acquired, uh, the various uh, dual directorship, if you will, in uh, some of these dealings, mm. the closeness of uh, former CEO Marcus Juister, and, and how 
as, as the former chairperson was saying, complex this whole thing is because it's got uh, a representation in various uh, countries and uh, across geopolitical lines. I mean, for starters, I was horrified to hear Mr. Christo Visse when he was leading testimony before Parliament that uh, Steinhoff is a very complex company. So the question becomes, well, why on earth, what on earth are you doing running a complex company? The duty of directors is to make it simple because directors carry a fiduciary duty. So you want a simplified structure so that the investors can have a clear see-through and understand really the risks that are involved and the potential benefits based on your ability to manage. So if you are confessing that the company is too complex, therefore I couldn't manage it, well, why on earth must we be buying the shares? But now I want to contrast what has just happened at Steinhoff with Mr. Visa offloading 70.47% of his shareholding to what happened with another company in Brazil, the EBX Group, ran by one Ike Batista. Now, in 2012, Ike Batista was the seventh richest man in the world. In 2012. And in one year, he lost over 30 billion US dollars in value of his shares within EBX Group. I think today they are worth just uh, over 100 million dollars thereabout, from 35 billion dollars to 100 million dollars. But this is what happened. As we speak here now, Ike Batista is in jail. Ike Batista could not sell, even in a fire sale situation. And whatever assets that he tried to, you know, pilfer in and, and hide and siphon off in various jurisdictions, the authorities and the regulators in Brazil did not let him go scot-free. The question, therefore, that must be asked, and particularly in the context of South Africa where we are, is that if you have somebody such as Christo Viso who is let off scot-free in the manner that he has, and moreover still even be able to keep some of the loot in the in this case three and a half billion rent that he has been able to salvage here the question that must be asked what message are we sending what message are the securities market regulators the jse the financial services board what message are they exactly sending out there because here we are seeing a patent failure by the securities market regulators from having stemmed out in december when the scandal broke out, and I've maintained that what we are dealing here with is nothing but short of a case of prodigious fraud. Therefore, if that been the case, why did they not put the stopgap measures? I've been involved in listings before. And mm. when you list a company, by the way, there are restrictions on the directors being able to sell the shares. The question becomes, why in this case when the scandal broke out, did the JSE particularly see no value in putting a restriction more so on people who ordinarily have got insider information. This is insider trading and it is absolutely, it is absolutely, uh, it is, it is yeah. destroyed. It is catastrophic for uh, uh, Leon, the Yes, markets. I mean, we were told that this is a, a, a potentially the biggest uh, financial scandal the, uh, of, of recent times in the sense that uh, what Seppo is saying that the financial regulators themselves being complicit in this particular uh, a scandal without uh, a following due process. But in your view, you, you, you seem to believe that uh, this is all above board, that he was allowed to do so because he would have observed a due diligence. What, what gives you that sense? No, let me make it very clear. Our financial regulators in South Africa are completely useless. They have not once uh, detected any fraud or any malpractice. They have not once fulfilled any of their obligations. Every time something like this, a fraud, a scandal, uh, has been uh, discovered or unearthed, it has been market operators. Uh, my view is they are so useless, they may be complicit, in which case they're actually doing something, they're actually awake. By and large, I think they're so useless they should simply be dissolved. They have not achieved anything at all, uh, and in that sense I complete, agree, agree, complete to a chapel. Uh, the question is this, though, that for Marcus Eurster or Christo Visa or anyone else, the, the uh, investment analysts at the PIC and so on, to go to jail or to be prosecuted, they have to have committed an offence. I do not trust our financial regulators to know an offence from a non-offence. I think they are, they've proven themselves to be a waste of time and money, and we really have to go back to the drawing boards about how these regulations are crafted and enforced. At the moment, uh, they might as well not exist.
All right, please stay on the line. Adil and Chabeleng Transform RSA president joins us. Uh, Adil, that how do we prove indeed that there was wrongdoing? Uh, in this case, uh, the reports that were also accessed by the Public Servants Association revealing that there is admission of guilt, uh, embellishing uh, their asset uh, book value, uh, buying properties uh, recklessly and also inflating what uh, the, the, the net value of the company is. Is this not especially from a South African law enforcement point of view, something that should have been treated with the urgency uh, that it deserves? Look, this, uh, uh, good evening, Cindy. This issue, actually, I'm so surprised that by now we don't have a single process that actually were incurred. The issue of whether there was wrongdoing is explicitly clear. There was huge gross level of wrongdoing involved in Steinhoff. The reports have indicated that there's been a lot of assets shifted and taken out of the company and stolen illegally and taken off to offshore accounts and everywhere else. And the other aspect of it is the fact that there has been 380 billion rand loss, which the stock market today, the Johannesburg JSE, can prove that that particular loss occurred as a result of what they call accounting irregularity. Anybody else who understands the terminology and the jargon in this sense, accounting irregularity just simply means fraud. And fraud means money has been stolen and actually assets as well as cash or whatever capital has actually been siphoned out of the company illegally. So it is not really an issue of whether was there any wrongdoing. The okay. question is why are South African authorities still sitting and not acting on this matter when every day they chase petty criminals and actually fill up our prisons with people who have really committed very little crime that do not even deserve uh, prison time. But in this case, we look at a company that has committed huge amount of fraud and not a single director, not a single shareholder has been brought to account, has been brought to book. We're even seeing an existing shareholder who has just sold off and cashed in on whatever remaining uh, equity as well as cash in the company that they had. And they were able to siphon out more cash out of it again. Christoph Viso's case is very classical to show you that these companies do not care whatsoever about anybody else but their own shareholders you know, interest. And in this case, Steinhoff executives, Steinhoff shareholders, as well as the Steinhoff, uh, you know, uh, auditors should by now have been wrapped around the knuckles and should have been taken to court and authority. And we should have had a South African court that expedited this. There was a time ago when we called for a tribunal that specialized in special crimes. That tribunal should be actually a 24-hour operating tribunal that should take individuals like this yeah. as well as companies right, like this just stay, to stay account. On, stay on the line in the, in the sense that is there a need for uh, policy reform? And we know that we're over-regulated as it stands, Tepo. But when it comes to how, the, the powers of the Competition Commission on collusion, for, for, for example, that robs the country of uh, revenue uh, and also um, creates an uncompetitive environment, that, they, that the penalties themselves, encourage this kind of behavior? Well, look, I think first and foremost, the question we should be asking, and legitimately so, is why is it exactly that two months to the day or more than two months to the day, Minister of Police Figile Mbalula has said absolutely nothing? Is it a question of perhaps not you know, understanding what we are dealing with here in terms of economic crimes, and therefore why would he be minister? Well, how come the commissioner of police has said absolutely nothing? The hawks, absolutely nothing. There has been no mention whatsoever of any investigation or even assuring South Africans that in fact they do have the capacity to be able to uh, investigate and be able to put a case before a competent court of law therefore to successfully prosecute so that people can be jailed. That is really where we need to be exerting more pressure. Let's look at what happened in the United States. We know as a matter of fact that uh, one of the big five uh, audit firms, Arthur Anderson, went belly up as a result of the accounting uh, fraud that they had done on behalf of their clients. We know that the directors of uh, uh, Enron, the chief financial mm. officer of Enron, is still in jail to this day for what they did in 2003. Welcome. If we talk about uh, AIG, in fact, the guy ended up even you know, you know, dying while he was in jail. Yep, I wish we could continue. Ben we really off. have to All very those, rap we rap need it up. to act against yeah. this. Yeah. And maybe this is the first question we should have asked, Leon. We'll give you the final word in the sense of consumers or of uh, the subsidiary companies, be it Checkers, Ackermans, um, Hi-Fi Corporation, and all the other ones. Why should we be concerned? 
concerned about the Steinhoff matter. If it's uh, essentially an international um, co complicated accounting irregularity that hasn't yet been defined. Uh, thank you, Cindy, for raising that. Uh, I think people are tending to forget that the allegation is that the irregularities occurred overseas. It's not entirely clear yet whether South Africa has any jurisdiction at all. And also, let me make something else clear, it's very simple arithmetic. When uh, Christo Visas, when one shareholder sells shares, Christo Visa, not one cent is taken out of the company. It's simply someone else has bought whatever, bought whatever the liabilities and assets are. But you're absolutely right. Our regulatory authorities, if they have jurisdiction and if there has been an irregularity that can be pursued and prosecuted in South Africa, do not know about it, have done nothing about it, and have proven themselves once again to be a completely useless waste of time and money. Can we separate ourselves, uh, Tsepa, though, from what uh, Leon is saying, that if uh, largely this has to do with international indices, that uh, South Africa does not necessarily uh, get or, or, or gets off unscathed? No, in the first instance, why was Steinhoff externalized? I listened to Nicky Newton, King, uh, yeah, Nicky Newton King of the JSE saying that, well, they are not the primary, it's not primarily listed on the JSE. That is unacceptable. They should never have been allowed to sell those shares. And even in Frankfurt Stock Exchange, where is the primary listing, they should never have. But I've got more trust in the German authorities being able to investigate and reverse any of this, the so-called sale, which uh, so Mr. Chris visited pocket 3.5 billion. So essentially, this yes, we do have jurisdiction. But in the first instance, Steinhoff should never have been allowed to be externalized for this to be a Netherlands-based company, a Dutch company. It is now a Dutch company with a primary listing in Frankfurt, with a secondary listing on the JSE, and that has added to the complexity. But most certainly, we are affected. There are investors. PIC have, also of course, lost well over 20. 7 billion you know yeah well over 27 billion almost 20 billion of their own as well as 9 billion of J&J &J that they handed out to J&J &J to also buy 2% into Steinhoff so of course we have interest as a country and value has been absolutely destructed through this how can it therefore be acceptable that the director who would have had intimate knowledge about the financials and we expect of him to have had intimate knowledge, how could he be allowed to pocket three and a half billion rent? Because that money went into his pocket. It didn't go into the company. He sold shares that he owned, shares that he held. And he's now no longer the largest shareholder because he only held 6.2%. Yeah, well, Dion, just on that very briefly and that there should be greater public outrage, especially when we're dealing with uh, public servants and their pensions, what they would be able to get out in, in uh, uh, returns or even yields has now been adversely affected by what's happening in Steinhoff. Leon, can you hear me? Can, uh, can, can you hear me? Hello, can yeah. you hear me? No, no. Yes. Yeah, very briefly. Every, every, everyone, including Christo Visa and PIC, buys shares in Steinhoff. That's what Christo Visa did. And now he sold shares. No money went into or out of Steinhoff other than dividends that went to everyone else, including PIC. I think there's a lot of confusion about how these things work. And uh, what we need to get clear is if there is a fraud. Oh, let me just immediately say where they list and where people put their money, it should never have been stopped and it should never have been regulated. That is indeed everybody's freedom and right, and it was all done according to law. No law was broken. So that was, that's not an irregularity. The irregularity is the misrepresentation, as in Israel, in Rom, of the value of shares and the value of assets in companies. In this case, primarily a company uh, in the United States and a few companies elsewhere. We have no knowledge of whether any misrepresentation of values took place mm. in the South African Leon, we're companies. out of time, and I think by my own admission as well, it's something I'd have to wrap my head around. But uh, Adilin Chabileng on Skype, thank you so much. So if you just really in 10 seconds were to explain to us why this should be of concern, especially if you were talking about externalizing the, the, the listing uh, of Steinhoff in the first place. Real money has been lost. We have got e enough in terms of company law. No company whatsoever should be allowed to be externalized. In this case, I would be surprised if the U.S. banks, City, as well as J.P. Morgan, will not be suing. All right, we're going to leave it there. As always, much appreciated. It's Apo Khadima joining us in Studio Luyen Low, Free Market Foundation Managing Director. And you at home, much appreciated. From myself and the crew, be abundantly blessed. Up next, the beautiful game with Abbas Elena Muleko.